Welcome. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. And I'm Sylvia Earle. I'm an ocean elder, explorer in residence, National Geographic, and founder of Mission Blue. <laughs> this is our show, Dive In, where we host informal and open conversations with the ocean community on on topics of wonder and interest. You can start uh, ask questions by putting them into the Q&A box. Well, I am going to just a minute here, try to find my screen sharing. Here we go. Hooray. <laughs> great technology. <laughs> it is great technology. There she is, the earth. The earth. <laughs> And we're going to remind everyone that the world is blue. Blue. Absolutely. <laughs> Today, we're going to be joined by Amanda Vincent. Dr. Vincent is co founder and director of Project Seahorse and a research fellow with the Royal Society of Canada and winner of the 2020 Indianapolis Prize and a Pew Fellow in Marine Conservation. She's a full professor in the Institute for Oceans and Fisheries at the University of British Columbia, Canada. Welcome, Dr. Vincent. You can turn on your camera and microphone if you would. Yep. Here she is. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> we have a couple of pictures of you here in the field. On the beach. On the beach. And beyond. <laughs> and ready to dive in with us. But you're in Vancouver right now, are you not? I am in Vancouver, as is that as are these pictures in Vancouver on a gray day. <laughs> <laughs> nice overcast day. The seahorses are they're kind of one of my very favorite fish. And I remember swimming around as a as a little kid in the seagrass beds around Cedar Key in Florida and seeing the, the little dwarf seahorses. And they're just so incredible. You just felt such excitement when you'd spot one kind of this little tail uh, hooked in there. And then later on, I found out that they had the distinction of being the world's slowest fish. <laughs> <laughs> they, they move at um, millimeters per hour. It's something like, <laughs> like a, less than five feet or, or 1.5 meters <laughs> per hour. It's just little slow pokey guys. <laughs> they can surprise you. So there are some slow pokey guys for sure, but there's 46 species, right? So there are some really speedy guys too. And if I'm finning hard on scuba, I can have trouble keeping up with some of them. Wow, that's oh. awesome. So there's some big bellied seahorses in Australia and some other species that can really shift it when they want to. Could you talk about some of their relatives? You know, it doesn't, when you think about what people think of as a fish, this doesn't look much like a fish, <laughs> really. I mean, yeah. it's got fins, it's got eyes and, but, it doesn't yeah, look good, like your typical fish. The good news, Liz, is the passion never leaves you. I still feel besotted with these creatures and absolutely love them. And I, even at looking at this one on the screen, I'm going, ooh, ah. Uh, so yeah, they're, it's uh, beautiful. They are magical. And they're about 46 species. So maybe let me start there. The, the smallest species is about the size of your baby fingernail. Like, just think about that, a full-grown seahorse. And the largest, um, which is the one found off Southern California and down the Eastern Pacific, is probably about the size of your forearm. So there's some really big size ranges there. Um, they all have much the same body shape, this, as you say, near mythical um, hmm. configuration. Um, and then their closest relatives are the pike fishes, which are like long stretched out linear seahorses um, and the sea dragons, which are the most frilly, fantastical, impossible fish, really. There are three species of those. Um, and then we have Farther away, those are all in the family Sydnathidae, about, I don't know, 320 species-ish. It's constantly changing. And what's and that then, mean, the Sydnathidae? So Sydnathidae. Means their jaws are fused together into that little snout. <laughs> yeah, the snout. and that snout is really useful. So that snout is like a suction device. It's like your vacuum cleaner at home. And these guys are, are ambush predators. They just, they hang and wait. They're not going to exert a whole lot of effort to chase usually. So they hang and wait. And when live food goes past or it crawls out of the benthos, out of the bottom, then they suck it in with a mighty suck. And they'll kind of eat anything live and moving of roughly the right size, which actually leads to some funny moments when they get, their judgment is wrong and they get something too big. And they end up choking for ages trying to actually 
clear they spell it. Yeah. Yeah. I love, and I love how watching them when they, because their eyes kind of are independently moving, almost like a chameleon, right? And you just watch them sort of like focus in and then bam, you know? <laughs> and that's not the only thing that's chameleon, as you know. I mean, first of all, that the eyes are wild, the two independent eyes. I wish we could do that. Um, but they, their bodies can really change. And you've got a gorgeous picture up right now with these skin filaments that they can grow to blend in better with their background. And those can come and go, but then the color changes are spectacular too. Yeah. So, um, they color change when they're courting, they brighten from their, their base color and when they're interacting, but they can really camouflage crazily. And I don't th think we understand the full range yet. I remember I was working on seahorses in Sydney Harbor in Australia in Port Jackson, um, and they were brown and dull and rather uninteresting colors. Uh, but I put down some survey tape, you know, the road flagging tape, the bright fluorescent orange stuff. Sure enough, the next day, the nearest seahorse had turned bright fluorescent orange to match the flagging wow. tape. Wow, that's amazing. So it's, huh. it's really a, a, an unusual feature. I mean, I mean you, know, you know, obviously the, People think about octopus being able to do it, and of course chameleons. But I don't think most people realize that seahorse can, you know, seahorses can adapt like that as well. Yeah, I think one of the cool things. Octopus, yeah. yeah. Sorry, so the cool thing is that the moms are dads and the dads are moms, or something like that. <laughs> well, the dads are dads. They're just very good dads. Let's yeah. that. <laughs> they just the moms pass the child bearing off to their partners. What a concept, yeah. right? Um, so so that, that's always raises questions, you know, in, in seahorses only the male gets pregnant. So maybe let me explain that because that's a bit of a showstopper. Yeah. So the female um, matures the eggs in her body. She transfers them to the male's brood pouch, um, which you see this, this is a male in this picture here with a brood pouch that the bit with only has skin, not ridges. That's his brood mm -hmm. pouch. And then um, she transfers them with a kind of penis equivalent called an ovipositor. Then they're, they're fertilized inside the male. And that's really critical because he knows he's the dad. And that's why he goes to all this work. And then within the pouch, they're offered oxygen through a capillary network and they're provided with placental fluid to nourish them. And the environment is regulated for 10 days to six weeks, depending on species and water temperature. And then at the end of that, he goes into labor and he pumps and thrusts for hours to release the young, which are then independent. Um, and people say, well, how do you know that he's the male? Well, you know, like all male animals that have sexual reproduction, he, he's got sperm and she's got eggs. And so he's got all the capacity of a male. He just has a little extra, je ne sais quoi. That's, <laughs> that's exactly it. They're just, just, just incredible creatures. Oh, okay. look at that. Oh, look at this guy. little dude. This is one of, is this one of the, uh, the pygmy ones you were talking about? Uh, this, is, this is pretty spectacularly beautiful. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. They, I was um, really shocked to discover uh, about five or six years ago, we knew about one of these species. No, I think we got up to two. Um, and now there's five more. So these pygmies are just being discovered all the time. And Sylvia, as you're fond of saying, you know, if you just look hard enough and pay attention to what's around you, it, there's all sorts of things to be found. And last year, they just found the first, all the pygmies have been found in Southeast Asia area, more or less, New Caledonia. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Indo-West Pacific. And last year, they just found one off South Africa. Oh. So that. What my friend who discovered it was saying, it's like finding a kangaroo in Scotland. You know, it's <laughs> wildly surprising. And so probably if anybody wants to get out there and dive, connect the dots, we're probably going to find them all through the Indian Ocean. Well, photographers have made a tremendous difference in some of these discoveries because they are really looking closely in ways that many divers, many people who are actually in the water where the seahorses are, uh, like the ghost pipefish. I have never seen one, although I have looked, but photographers come back with images of these extraordinary creatures on a kind of a regular basis. When somebody finds one, they know where to go and they tend to hang out in the same place. They're real homebodies. And all these guys are homebodies. Yeah, all of this, this, you know, these families. So I should have mentioned the ghost pipefishes because they're the sister, um, sister family to these seahorse pipefish and sea dragons. So. Solanostomidae, the ghost pipe fishes, are the sister family to Signathidae, these fused jaws fishes we're talking about. But what's very cool about the ghost pipe fishes is they've fused their pelvic fins to form a pouch, and the female cares for the young in the fused pouch created by pelvic fins. So it's not part of her body the way it is in males, but it's still very funky. 
You know, um, fish do the most remarkable things. <laughs> they really do. It's like they've been around for so long, our fellow vertebrates. <laughs> hey, I want to pick up on something you said about photography, though. So we um, do community science called IC Horse, which is part of the iNaturalist family. Oh, right. Um, and in IC Horse, we really welcome your submissions of photos that you have uh, seahorses or knowledge about seahorses. And here's the excitement in the validated photographs. So we know that the species is right. 15% of those, one in six, 15% are outside the previously known range of the seahorses. That's the wow. information we're getting from divers. Yeah. That's it's, so cool. It's something that, you know, divers can easily contribute to the, all this uh, lack of, you know, incredible lack of so, data that's out there on, on the seahorses in their kin. So that's a yeah, huge people, plus. People so, yeah, to ask you about this photo liz look at this photo yes. i'm diving think about it for a minute ignore the seahorses and look at my dive gear and what about this photo surprises you a bit hmm. <laughs> oh no i was focused on the seahorses i'm sorry <laughs> i don't have a regulator in my mouth i'm going to die and i was, in I was a going to say wait oh there it is yeah you don't well the seahorses are obstructing it i couldn't tell are, are, you, are you going to kiss them or I don't know, the photographer Aced just tried to try it without the regulator. And I thought, well, as long as you move quickly, we can do that. So, that's, right. you know, that's the photographer who always says that. Just take that out for a second. And you're just like, okay. <laughs> Let's just hold that pose for a yeah, while. Hold the pose. Yeah. So is this a pair that you have? Uh, this, yeah, I think it was a pair. I think we found them together. It certainly looks like it. It's certainly a male on the, um, on the left of the photo. And yeah. I think it's female on the right. Yeah. They, yeah. Do, they do tend to stick together for... Yeah. Long periods of time. Um, and yeah, but I mean, everything we're talking about, the, you know, the pair bonding and the male parental care, which means relatively slow reproductive rates and the site fidelity, all these things really add to their vulnerability. And yeah. Are, and it's, know, it, and it, they really are at, at such incredible risk. And it's, and it's not just sort of one thing, but it's this sort of host of things. It's all the things we're putting into the, into the ocean, the, because most of them are coastal. So it's, you get all these kinds of, Crow that we're putting out into the ocean it's all the stuff that we're doing to the ocean and particularly the you know the bottom trawling is just horrendous for these guys because they're so um as we were saying they're such homebodies they don't really and they're slow swimmers um for the most part <laughs> and they they just they're just wiped out by a trawler the threat comes on several different levels um for many of the most threatened seahorses and pipe fishes it they're in shallow lagoonal estuarine systems where habitat damage is a very big concern. So we do worry about that in these inshore transitional waters, but we're most worried, as you, as you rightly point out, by egregious fishing, bad fishing practices. I mean, fishing is fine, but bad fishing practices are a major concern. And not just illegal, but legal bad fishing practices are a major concern. Trolling um, is legal, and it shouldn't yeah. be. So it's, and bottom trawling is particularly appalling. Um, that you have, um, I mean, let's just make sure everybody knows what bottom trawling is, right? So I want you to imagine your favorite hillside, your favorite forest or woodland or grassland, whatever it is, natural habitat, and helicopters coming with a stretched razor wire between them that they drop to ground level and they shear off everything in their path. They shear off every bush and every tree and every blade of grass and they leave behind and they take out every bear, bird, butterfly, bee. And that then is transported to shore, maybe sorted slightly now, and the rest is reduced to uh, food for chickens or aquaculture. Ground that's up. what bottom trawling is. Bottom trawling is, is just rape and pillage, really. You're just pulling everything out of the ocean. It's completely astonishing mm -hmm. that we allow this to continue. It would never be allowed on land. And it's, there's a carbon connection obviously when you think about it it's obvious that these are all carbon based creatures like clear cutting a forest you're not only destroying and releasing carbon to the atmosphere when you kill it but you've destroyed the carbon capturing mechanisms that that are part of the cycle the climate cycle is a carbon cycle yeah i mean absolutely so we're just i think beginning to understand that the blue carbon the carbon released from the sea grasses and the sediments is really going to disrupt yet further um, the carbon storage, the carbon sequestration that we care so much about. Um, but you know, and that's, that's a, another major concern, but the list is endless. So in many areas of the world, um, 
the trawl fisheries are basically fueled by slave labor or indentured labor. So people who are literally trapped on the vessels for years and subject to summary punishments and executions. So yeah. is that discussed? Or the fact that these bottom trawlers all lose money, basically. The vast majority of them lose money and they're subsidized by our public money. So yeah. our dollar, our taxpayer money is- yeah, we, we talked a lot about the, the you know, like the, the, the slavery issues and the, you know, the human factors and so forth. And we had Ian Urbina on one of our episodes earlier in the year. And, oh, yeah. Right. And, um, and it, it and, but it's, but you're right, you know, it's, it's, it's the human factors, it's the carbon, and it's just this clear cutting of biodiversity. It's wrong. And you can just see it in it's this image, wrong. you know, you've got this, this poor seahorse who's just uh, sitting there suffocating along with, you know, all this other uh, wildlife. And it's- well, what's interesting is this was actually a shrimp trawler in the Gulf of California. So this was directed at shrimp. And first of all, you can see there's a lot of other stuff in there. Right. But, um, and often the more, um, the better, the cleaner uh, bottom trawling still gets maybe 80 to 90% bycatch, 80 to 90% they didn't mean to catch. But right. we're actually now really concerned about something that I'm calling annihilation trawling, which is when boats go to sea without even a declared target catch. So they are going to go back to Sylvia's point, they're going literally for carbon. Bio. And that carbon is then, it doesn't matter whether you're getting a worm or a shark, it's going to be reduced basically to carbon, which much. is then used for animal feed or agriculture feed, fish feed. Yeah. People um, don't realize that how much, um, you know, if you're even consumers who are trying to be more mindful and maybe not eating uh, wild caught fish as much, but if they, and they're switching over to, you know, chicken or turkey or, or something like that, but there's still oftentimes a, a ocean wildlife component because many of the pelleted feeds are made up of this sort of, uh, you know, bycatch material. Fish meal. Uh, fish it's meal. A, that's what it's called. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not a meal of fish, it's, it's, his meal's made of fish. Yeah, this is so, um, this is an interesting story because what you're showing here is um, seahorses are sold primarily for traditional Asian medicines, particularly Chinese medicine. And I have no quarrel with the cultural basis for that because working with the traditional Chinese medicine suppliers, they too want to see it sustainable. And that we've found great allies often in the traditional Chinese medicine community. Um, so that's one big pressure. But what's interesting is this is almost told by catch. So the traditional Asian medicine trade is not actually driving the capture of seahorses. It's actually responding to the capture of seahorses in large measure in those trawls. Mm -hmm. And then there is a big aquarium trade um, for home and public aquaria. And then there's a souvenir and curiosity trade. Yeah. And, you know, this, this we worried hugely about this Asian trade for a long time before we realized that it was really responding to bycatch more than driving the destruction. It's just hard to imagine that there are so many in Asian markets, though. I've, <laughs> I've seen them like these images. Just well, just... I remember as a, as a kid, you know, visiting Tarpon Springs and you know seeing the big bucket of sponges and a big bucket of shells and then a huge bucket of seahorses. <laughs> it was like, where do they all come from? This is it just well, it's crazy. as a diver. It's it's always such a a joyful shock when you when you see a seahorse and then to see them you know by the hundreds dried out like dried this. out you wonder how on earth but but seahorses <laughs> seahorses are one of the first marine species to be placed on the uh CITES red list and um you were really kind of behind that whole drive to get them listed and it's such an important thing uh working with the IUCN and founding a specialist group to to be able to afford these guys some protection, which in turn affords in, entire biosystems protection. But can you yeah. um, can you tell us a little bit about that and how that you know how that came about and how they're you know how does that IUCN protection get enforced? So yeah, we we as you say two sets of protection. One is well two sets of listings. One listing is the IUCN red list where we did the first conservation assessments for the species and recently completed the entire family and published a paper on that. And the, the red list assessments um, give us cause to cause for concern. About a third of the seahorses are vulnerable in some measure, threatened with extinction. And about a third, we know too little to draw a conclusive assessment, so they could be in trouble. And about a third may be okay. And um, for the pipe fishes, about half of the pipe fishes, we can't even assess their status. So these are really serious concerns for the IUCN red list. 
And that is a flagging device. That's to remind us to pay attention. That's to focus attention and efforts. And then the other thing you mentioned, which is very, very important, is the CITES. So CITES um, is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. And CITES um, is a, an agreement between 182 countries plus the European Union to regulate exports of wildlife and plants, of course, um, to levels that will not damage wild populations. And it's done through two lists. Um, Appendix one, the list one, is for species that should not be exported, should not be in trade with rare exceptions. And list two, appendix two, is for species where the trade is or may threaten the, the species. Um, and so CITES had systematically refused to get involved in marine fish issues, claiming that they were the concern of the FAO, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization or fisheries management agencies, treating them as very other, whereas of course, marine fishes are wildlife too. Right. And so we pushed yeah. very, very hard to try to get the seahorses on this listing. And we did it very strategically by coming at it through interesting angles rather than a confrontation. So the first marine fishes ever put on this regulatory list were the seahorses, which was uh, you know, wonderful and exciting. They're also the first ones for which parties, the countries have been asked to prove they're doing their job. And a few faltered. So it was the first sea, uh, fishes for which there were export bans implemented as a result of these failures to, to achieve sustainability. And then um, now we're working really hard with those governments to move towards much better sustainable management of, of their resources. Uh, but it's tremendously exciting because when the seahorses were listed, the argument that we don't deal with fishes kind of fell apart, marine fishes. Right. Good. So some parks were listed, some rays were listed, um, European eel was listed, well that's freshwater as well of course, and angelfish and Mexican angelfish was listed and so on. So we've now got quite a lot of species with seahorses kind of leading the way going through the CITES management processes. Um, and with the good news, we've just about to finish a paper, so I'll give you a sneak preview here, that shows that CITES made a huge difference to the live trade in seahorses. It really did release the pressure on the ocean for live trade in seahorses. Great, that's excellent. Dry, yeah, dry trade in seahorses, not so much, but that's mostly because the big pressure comes from these bottom trawlers, right? Yeah. So and Amanda, what are seahorses supposed to do for you? <laughs> Dead. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, I mean, seahorses are used in compounds, so they're not usually taken by themselves. They're in multi, multi ingredient medicines. Um, they're used to treat a whole range of ailments um, from asthma, arteriosclerosis, impotence, incontinence, thyroid disorders, broken bones. But we don't we don't get into cultural wars on this because I just wondered what what why it is thought that they do do good for you in some medicinal way. Sometimes they're very targeted and sometimes there's a tr truth to it, but often when you can determine cause and effect, you can find an alternative. Like aspirin yeah. started with, with grinding up the roots of um, willow, willow trees. trees and now you don't have to do that anymore. Yeah, I mean, there is undoubtedly, you know, long cultural history, medicinal history in using um, the seahorses and the pipefishes actually, some pipefishes, for traditional medicine. And it's not, I mean, it, as I say, the problem is even if we release the demand for those dried seahorses, we're gonna to continue to get over exploitation. We're gonna to continue to get population declines right. until we bring the most destructive fishing practices under control. So right. I can target my time at working with Asian communities and we do find remarkable partnerships there, but much more importantly is to stop this silliness because as you say when they're so let me give you a sense seahorses most trawl boats only catch about one seahorse per boat per night maybe two seahorses per boat per night nothing and then i tell you that countries like vietnam or thailand or india were exporting five million ten million seahorses oh, it tells you about the trawl pressure right right um, about the trawl pressure and so what we should we, we should be using seahorses as kind of sentinel species index species for the thousands of species in the bottom of the net right. that have no specialist group, that have no champion. No voice, no, no voice. voice. Oh. Exactly. So and if I, we could get it sorted for the trawling, it would help a lot. Yeah, I know they had a, uh, in 2016, they had a shipment that was uh, impounded in Peru and it had 8 million dried seahorses. Cool. And 
it was a really cool cool story behind those. Yeah. We've discovered that a lot, we had a shipment recently that was traveling from Peru to um, Hong Kong and Vietnam, and it was seized, but it turned out the seahorses had actually been caught in West Africa. Wow. wow. West African species, they'd been transshipped in Peru, wow. and we're now heading off to the Asian markets. And even more interestingly, and I digress, they were wrapped in donkey skins, wet donkey skins. No. <laughs> and I had not realized till now that there is a significant trade in donkey skins. Yeah, donkeys are getting endangered at this point. It's so that was so sea horses and the donkeys were going together. But Aww. again, I think we do better by finding um, convergence of interests with our tremendous Asian uh, universities, NGOs, government agencies. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Rather than, you know, it's, it's, Remember that again, um, the bottom trawling happens all around the world. This is a global yeah. responsibility. Yeah, I mean, you see, you've seen, you know, like images from space or or from planes of just these trawlers just going out and the huge sediment plume that's kicked up. Um, so it's just this this churning of the bottom constantly. There's no way that these systems can recover. Um, and at the end of the day, there's they're just coming up with the empty nets because they keep going back over and over again, yeah. uh, replowing the, the same territory. Yeah, and it's mm -hmm. and you can't have these carbon sequestering seagrass beds to support such oxygen generating carbon sequestering. Yeah. <laughs> but so there's, also issues, there's interesting issues there because a lot of the research on bottom trawling is done in North America, Western Europe, developed countries where trawling has been going on for quite a long time, and um people the research often shows that there's not much impact of bottom trawls but that's <laughs> because you've already had 74 toes over that area the 75th toe won't look very different after it's gone Nothing like yeah. the first one <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh, it is really very serious if you go to an area that hasn't been trawled and then after it has been trawled it's well it's quite astonishing so yeah. you are at work saving the seahorse paving the way <laughs> <laughs> probably some of the policy work we do. So our, our team is called Project Seahorse and we work at all sorts of scales. So we obviously, as you've inferred, care a lot about the biology of the animals, but for the seahorses to thrive, you need protected areas, you need designated zones, you need hope spots where yeah. we can actually have areas that are, are kept in better shape that are supported physically. And then for that to happen, you obviously have to deal with the people who put pressure on the area. In this case, we're looking at Filipino fishers in some islands in the central Philippines who were helping us um, work to develop an MPA. And it was entirely a community led initiative and is community enforced. We have 35 marine protected areas from these community based initiatives that are holding strong. Um, and then of course the protected areas are gonna depend on the attitudes of in this case fishers, but it could be dredgers or miners or shippers mm -hmm. or whatever. So you work with them and then they make better decisions if their communities are supported. So if you have sure. schools and housing and so on, so you work with them and that works better if you have governance and economic opportunity and law and order. So we work at all those scales regionally, nationally and globally, as we've been saying with CITES. And we have this kind of onion scheme, if you can imagine a cross section of an onion with right. these concentric rings of pressure bearing down on the seahorses. And I think where Project Seahorse is unusual is we we address all those rings of pressure, often through collaborations and partnerships to to release the actual impact on the seahorses in the center of the scheme. But of course, when you're tackling marine protected areas or CITES regulations or national legislation, you're going to do some good for a lot of other species too. Yeah, and I love the overlap with the you know with some of the hope spots. In fact, there's one in South Africa that has a little seahorse as its as its icon and it's the most endangered species and it's in the hope spot for a nice little lagoon system as you say right and it's found so in three lagoons we, we should uh, team up and those 35 places that are special for seahorses maybe we can get them enlisted as hope spots and amplify the message let's talk about that yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good, for sure. <laughs> and, and it's just, you know, the, the alignment and the, the lash up is really there because, you know, you're working at the community level. It's Every one of the hope spots has a, you know, a champion or more, and, yeah. at least one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you're really trying to bring in the, all those local partners and the onion and skin, the onion, the, skin. The, the onion rings, whatever. The Andaman Islands, which is one of your hope spots, that's um, got one, a vulnerable pipefish species there uh, that's freshwater. So mm -hmm. we're all concerned with, of course, the entire ridge to reef aquascape right. 
um, from you know the first rivulet to the deepest abyss, which you know, Sylvia, those are this is an aquascape, and the the freshwater is all part of the same story, really. So there are some threatened there are pipe fishes, no seahorses, but pipe fishes in freshwater, and they're in bad shape mostly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, most people don't ever they don't even see them because they're even less as you say they're kind of like a seahorse stretched out and so they they're so camouflaged that they're really tough to spot yeah yeah no great There's work lots of room for collaboration for sure on protected areas you know we we do a lot of protected area work as a response to countries needing to implement um, sustainable export regulations or regulations to ensure sustainable exports and one of the recommendations we make is for more attention to meeting their obligations for protected areas. Um, as, as of course you two know, uh, as of last year, according to their agreements under the Convention on Biological Diversity, most countries were meant to have 10% fully protected. Right. 10% uh, protected, sadly not fully protected, but 10% protected. But now the push, as a lot of people listening will know, is for 30% protected by 2030. And we're trying to say that protecting the seahorses is part of meeting your obligations. Yes, absolutely. Thirty. So, well, you you uh, had a paper or you know, you helped author a paper that came out in the Oryx this past May that spoke about um, the global extinction risk for up to three hundred species of fishes, including seahorses, and the real lack of data uh, that exists for at least seventeen kinds of seahorses and ninety-seven other species of of their related fishes. Um, how can the diving community really help in, um, you know, filling in some of those data gaps for you? Look, a couple of ways. One is, as I mentioned, we have iSeahorse, which is our community science program, which is embedded in iNaturalist. So um, if you can put your seahorse entries into iSeahorse, your pipefish entries into iNaturalist, your sea dragon entries, your trumpet fish entries, all the rest of them into iNaturalist, that would be fantastic. And then also for those who are feeling really keen, we actually have developed a population monitoring program where you can go back to the same population using the same methods repeatedly on intervals that work for you and let us have your data as to what's happening in those particular locations mm -hmm. um, with sort of sightings per unit effort. And so we have complete protocols for those including video tuition, video tutorials rather. So if anybody wants to actually commit to monitoring repeatedly the same area, um, anywhere in the world, we'd be absolutely thrilled to talk to a dive club or to talk to a group of naturalists or talk to a school group. Um, we also have protocols available if you want to monitor ports. Let's say you live near a fishing port that has trawl boats coming in, or, <laughs> or it could be stain netters or anything else, lobster pots spring up seahorses and want to tell us how that is changing over time. Uh, we'd love your help with that. And of course, inevitably, um, we would love your help in writing to vote, vote for the ocean, make yes. sure you vote is for the ocean. Um, and when you vote for the ocean, ask a lot of probing questions, you know, are you, what's your party's policy on protecting the ocean? What's your party's policy on fisheries regulations? And let's, let's get some votes working for us. Um, and then, you know, of course, our, our website, which uh, I hope somebody's going to put up, projectseahorse.org, we yep. can absorb all forms of support. We can absorb in-kind support, financial support. Of course, we all need that. Um, and you know, we're we're here to be champions for these species for sure. Yeah, they're just wonderful little critters. And you know, having the, I think having some of the historic information that exists for the seahorses is is critical. And then having that um, as a baseline, and then really looking at all this new data coming in, it can it can really help us to understand how is the protection doing? Do we need to do more? Are there key areas that we're missing? And really being able to kind of stitch it together um, in meaningful ways. Yeah, I mean, there's so many ways that people can contribute. And divers, I'd love you to talk up the need to judge your seafood carefully. That's always useful. Um, what, you know, I drive restaurants and, and supermarkets crazy by going in and saying, was any of this <laughs> bottom trawls? Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and they say, well, I don't know. And I said, well, you really should know if you're selling it. And so I keep going in and eventually they usually do discover the answer because they're tired of me asking whether it's called <laughs> bottom trolls. So if it's called yeah. by bottom trolls, you've got to run a mile. You just got to get out of there. You don't buy the stuff. So exactly. And, you know, it, it, everyday consumers can can really make better choices, make better choices and will be drivers should, of change. You should want to know what you're putting in yourself as food. You should want to know yeah. where it came from. <laughs> what it's been eating before you start to eat. 
this is a kind of interesting picture. This is us meeting with the Hong Kong Chinese Medicine Merchants Association. So the people who yeah. import and wholesale the traditional medicines. And they have become phenomenal allies. You'll see our posters up behind them in their boardroom. Um, and they meet with us. They allow us full access to their warehouses to get um, under, understanding of changes in trade over time. They have put in voluntary codes of conduct. So this is the Association of Medicine Merchants in mm -hmm. Hong Kong. And this is what I mean by saying that you can find allies everywhere. Um, I once talked to somebody who was a traditional Chinese medicine doctor, and he asked me, what was my goal for seahorses? And I said, well, you know, usually in ecology, we talk about having viable populations over a thousand year projection. And he went, a thousand years sounds about right. Yeah, let's <laughs> try that in the West and talk to a politician about a thousand years. And see yeah, they're like, uh, what's the election cycle? You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, or, we or with most businesses, it's the next quarter. Yeah, the next quarter. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we generally find that if you if you're asking questions and listening, there's always a point of convergence. There's always a chance to collaborate. You may not find it immediately, but it's there somewhere, and that gets yeah. exciting. So, Amanda, I'd be very curious to know. If any new species have been found in these markets. There are new species that have been found in the Tokyo fish market that have never been found in nature yet, just there. <laughs> they have no idea where it originated, but it's a new species of several variations on the, the theme of fish and crustaceans too, that halt, get hauled up to be eaten, but nobody knows where they came from or how they live or how long they live so much that we don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, I've not heard of one found in trade, but there's certainly, we're still finding species and, you know, they're coming up in bottom trolls. So the bottom trolls are sampling the bottom for us, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we do end up with one through, you know, we just not through trawling. Well, kind of through trawling. Um, a new third species of sea dragon was found, the ruby sea dragon. And that was a deeper sea species that I think I'm right in saying was originally caught in, in gear. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it turned out when they went looking for it, there were actually some already in museums that nobody had grasped were <laughs> sea dragons. So we've got the sea has so many more exciting things to share with us. Oh, well, when we, when we when we get when we get our submersibles uh, finished up, I want to go down and see how deep the seahorses really go. You know? Yeah, well, you, you must come. <laughs> I'd love to come. We, yeah, they yeah. get them at least 100 meters. We get them brought up in trolls from 100 meters. So at least 100 meters. But yeah, I mean, it would be really interesting to see just how. And also, I think there are some more that are a bit more pelagic than we realize, a bit more open ocean than we realize. Yeah, they probably, yeah, they'd probably just like drift through the, the Sargasso the Sea. Currents. Yeah, Sargasso Sea. Well, they do some rafting. So mm -hmm. they hold on to, um, what well, did you say, Sargasso or could Stuff. be really anything. They can hold on to debris as well. That's where there's a debris connection and they can they can raft like that. And oh, that probably that picture in the National Geographic of a seahorse with its little tail wrapped around a Q-tip. Oh yeah, around the little cotton bud. That was unbelievable. Yeah, and I mean, plastics, maybe let's touch on that. Plastics are, are an issue for sure for marine life. And I, you know, we need to pay attention to it. But I do think it's really important that people grasp that the biggest threat to the ocean wildlife is fisheries, not plastics. Yeah, um, you know, fisheries. Got it right. Government gives plastics a lot of attention, and I'm a bit cynical and say it's partly because uh, plastics are more tractable. You can ban plastic straws and ban plastic forks, and you know it's it's relatively easy to do. Um, whereas fisheries are kind of complicated to get sorted out, but the more all of us ask for the attention to remain on fisheries first and foremost, the farther we're gonna be. See, I mean, I'm not dismissing the importance of plastics, but they're the, the biggest threat by far to marine biodiversity is untrammeled, um, poorly managed fisheries. And we can make fisheries sustainable. That's what's so annoying, it is doable. I know. So, well, we've got a little, I think we've got this little video coming up next that's gonna um, kind of give us a little snapshot of all your efforts with the seahorses and uh, leading into the amazing Indianapolis prize. Let's see if we can make this happen here. There you go. <laughs> uh -huh. Let's check this out. The Indianapolis prize is considered to be the top award you can earn in animal conservation. So it's a little bit surreal to think, wow, okay, I'm there. And the fact that it is 
really garnering an international reputation and, and recognition will help a lot because then you have that as a platform on which to speak about really vital, important issues. You can't be dismissed as you know, a marginal effort if you've won the Indianapolis Prize. Dr. Amanda Vincent was the first biologist to study seahorses underwater. As the founder of Project Seahorse, Vincent spent the bulk of her early career underwater, discovering that the tiny mysterious fish form permanent pair bonds. The very first things that we learned about seahorses in the oceans come from Amanda's pioneering research. In doing that, she brought the magical world of the seahorse above water. We have a very unusual approach in our Project Seahorse team where we put seahorses at the center of the universe. I think seahorses are a very potent flagship species because they have such a readily identifiable charisma. When you reach out and tickle a seahorse's tail and it lets go and grabs onto your hand and sits there, so sort of staring at you. They're so unreal, they're so mythical. That mythology is a driving force that keeps the seahorse on black markets around the world. Annually, millions of seahorses are harvested for use in traditional medicine practices. Vincent has worked tirelessly to uncover illegal trade and has created relationships to move towards the sustainable harvesting of seahorses and other ocean wildlife. They're saying that the seahorses in trade should be at least 10 centimeters height. As the chair of the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Seahorse Specialist Group, Vincent successfully fought to place the seahorse and other marine fishes on the IUCN's red list. She then led the way for the listing of seahorses at the 2002 Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, the first marine fish to be included in the convention since it was signed. As a consequence, the 182 signatory nations to CITES are required to regulate seahorse exports for sustainability. That was an unbelievable watershed in marine conservation. It transformed our view of fish from being food to being biodiversity. Seahorses, I think, were probably Amanda's shrewdest move. If you reach the objective of saving seahorses, having more seahorses somewhere, you can only achieve that by having a healthier marine habitat. Vincent's trailblazing work with local governments and citizens led to the establishment of marine protected areas where seahorses live. The first areas she set up were in the Philippines, with the model spreading to over 35 protected areas around the globe. If you do it right, then that community tells the next all about it and the next one is easier. That's what's made marine protected areas so common in the Philippines that villages see the benefits and they want one. Fish are recovering, seahorses are getting larger. We couldn't have done those except by generating. I have no idea how Amanda does everything that she does. She's a mom to two children. I guess she has a bigger plate than most of us. There's a long way to go and luckily I have lots of life left in me to do it. We've put in decades and decades of hard work and developed innovative ways of tackling things and a very holistic approach to conservation that was perhaps not common when we started. The fact that that is now being recognized as having really made a difference is very special. It's awesome. And seahorses are clearly loved by so many people. And yeah, it's very fun to sit back and see videos like that, because when you're in the thick of it, as you guys know too well, all you can think about is, how do we get this done? Oh my goodness, that's tiring. There's an obstacle. How do we overcome it? And it's, it's always nice when you get to sit back. And I know there's a wonderful similar video about Sylvia's you know, tremendous achievements. And it just gives you a sense of perspective. You go, oh my goodness, I guess we have got things done through it all. Yeah, we managed. <laughs> so. Wonderful. But, you know, when we announced that, that you were going to um, be joining us as our guest, it was so great to have a teacher who uh, asked her class to weigh in on seahorses. And these are some of the images that they came back with. And they're just so wonderful. I mean, kids just love seahorses, kids of all ages. Yeah, I'm one. <laughs> yeah, I'm one too. Yeah. <laughs> and just to see 
you know, the creativity, um, but just such an, such iconic creatures. Oh, they're beautiful. And they've got, they've got all sorts of colors on them, which actually represents something close to reality. I like their manes, that penciled one on the top with the one. I know, isn't that gorgeous? Yeah. It's wonderful in filaments. And the big belly must be a male. Yeah, it must be a male. <laughs> <laughs> just look at them. Yeah, it's just. So I've just, I'm going to say one minute, I'm going to pause for one minute. I just had a son come home. I'm just going to greet him for one second, if people don't mind. One second. Go, <laughs> bring him in. <laughs> Anyhow, there we go. 12 there we go. Camp. Good mom. Excellent. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I just love this one. It's got kind of a like, we, I. <laughs> that one's had a very full life i think and this is uh, just because you're the star for the seahorses <laughs> yeah but you know sea stars and seahorses live in very similar habitats and sea stars have their problems at the moment that's for sure so absolutely Similarly, they're curios they're taken just because they're beautiful well, yeah and the they are are terrible diseases at the moment for sea stars on the on the west coast of north america right. That yeah, too. that was the sea star and the seahorse. Well done. I know, right? Very well done. The, I think that's the, the last one I've finale. got here. Gonna stop well, sharing. it always makes me happy when yeah. young people are enthusiastic about marine life because we need a whole generation or three coming up behind us. So, yeah, here yeah. we go. <laughs> Excellent. There you are. Excellent is right. Well, I think we're going to go on to our Q and A. Great, love to hear some questions. Um, let's see. Hillary's asking us, are seahorses impacted by noise pollution in the ocean? Ah, huh. interesting question. Oh, it's such a good question. They do communicate using noise. So they actually have um, a kind of clicking noise when they're, we don't know what that clicking noise means, but there is a clicking noise that they make. If anybody wants to do research, the whole issue of sound is, is still wide open. Um, and I think it's entirely possible. I mean, that, that they may well be affected. They have a swim bladder, um, which would reverberate, I guess, with some noise. So I'd love to know the answer to that myself because we've certainly got quite noisy oceans um, in many areas yeah. now. So there's an, there's an area for study. We suspect all mammals communicate with sound. Birds, as far as we know, all birds. I suspect the same is true of fish. We just haven't tuned in to their communication system. They've been around so much longer than birds and mammals. They've developed strategies for having families, for mating, for finding food, for their shapes, their sizes, their eyes. There has to be something to this business of sound, sound reception and sound generation as well. So you're right. Yeah, so I'm with my parents right, right now. One second, sorry. Hmm. So yes, um, uh, the the um, seismic shooting that we use for oil exploration definitely does a lot of, has a lot of impact on marine mammals. But uh, there are some papers starting to show the connection between seismic shooting and and fishes as well. So there definitely yep. are responses. Even plankton. Uh, yeah, I'm not at all a sound expert, but it's it's an area that would bear analysis, bear research for sure. Yeah. Brenda is asking us, um, would protecting seahorses reduce the effects of climate change? Protecting seahorses will certainly help reduce the effects of climate change and lots of different ways. If we get it right for seahorses, it'll mean we're getting it right for or we're reducing the pressure on the ocean. For example, remember the bottom trawls take seahorses, but they also mess up the whole carbon storage on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So if we can stop bottom trawls from taking up seahorses, we will have done a lot to protect that carbon storage in the bottom of the ocean. Also, seahorses live in seagrass beds. Seagrass beds are the only flowering plants in the ocean. They need light to be flowering plants in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And as the water gets deeper as sea levels rise, then seagrasses are going to have a lot of trouble. So to protect, if we protect the seahorses and their habitats, then we will have done a lot of good to respond there. Um, 
a lot of our we're having trouble because a lot of our shores are what we call armored a lot of our coastlines have yeah. walls and groins and docks and rock falls and that prevent the seagrasses from moving inland as as sea levels rise um, so we need to make certain that we we get rid of a lot of that armoring on our coastline to allow seagrasses and other species to migrate to shallower water as sea levels rise again the seahorses are kind of the representatives of the health of the seagrass beds so in order to protect seahorses, we're gonna to have to protect their habitats and manage the fisheries. And doing those things is going to really indicate that we are finding a way to respond to climate change. But so the connection, like don't drive as much. Let's, let's, protect, our, let's protect our climate and that way also protect our seahorses and their habitats. Yeah, it, it, it all just ties together in such a yeah, fundamental way. Everything connects. Yeah. Um, Tom is asking, he says, I've traveled to the Philippines as a tourist diver. Are there opportunities to leverage the dive industry to help expand marine protected areas? Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, one big way is when I go to marine protected areas in developing countries, some of the better managed ones have a, have a dive fee. You actually have to pay a bit to dive in the protected area, which often has the best marine wildlife. And the dive fee is laudably, um, is lamentably small. It's often really, really little for Westerners. So you might have to pay $2 a day or something to dive in a reserve. And if you're if you're somebody who has a, a few more dollars than that, it would be really wonderful if you could add to that and you know, really indicate how much you approve of the protected area to try to generate the response to expand that protected area. So there's ways like that. There's also ways of voting with your fins and actually going <laughs> to areas with protected, choosing protected areas, indicating yeah. you've chosen it because it has a protected area. And protected areas come in lots of different forms. So we always need to ask what's meant by protection. In some cases, it's in Canada, we have protected areas that allow bottom trawling. I know, right? <laughs> so, you know, this is not, and Britain has the same, this is not a protected area. Wow. So let's insist with our policymakers and let's insist with our resource managers, let's insist with our coastal communities that we're looking for true protection, meaningful protection. And, you know, divers are an empowered bunch. We've got voices, we've got, you know we've got an influence so let's let's use it for sure our dive associations need to become very vocal advocates for yeah. areas like let's see all of our dive clubs and dive societies and dive associations take really loud perspectives on this yeah we've, we've really we really expanded it out with with mission blue and and even at, at, at doer with our with our deep ocean explore store that we opened up we're just trying to really empower divers to go out and and go back to the same locations mm -hmm. The ambassadors ambassadors recognize you know individual fishes um mm -hmm. yeah which which really happens with things like you know goliath grouper and things like that but it can really happen with something like a seahorse too because they sure. are such home bodies you know you could go back and see that same pair uh let's be a bit careful when we're in when we go dive you know let's choose our dive opportunities really really carefully choose yeah choose um, dive resorts or choose dive liverboards that actually are meaningful in the yes. way that we give back. I mean, it, you know, lots of people can greenwash or bluewash, but let's make certain that we're really being thoughtful. And I'm astonished sometimes to find that people who are really committed divers go to um, a dive spot and then eat a lot of seafood without questioning where it came from. <laughs> let's go to Yosemite and have a bear steak, you know? <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> Eating seafood is fine if it's going to yeah. support sustainable local fishery, but but let's let's ask the questions um, before we we plunge in. No pun intended. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I think divers, you know, we we are the frontline defense for the ocean, and we need to be actually using that um, that fascination, that commitment to the ocean to lever change. And most of all, you know, again, vote with your fins. Actually, let's make it a high priority issue in every election. Yeah, got that right. Jenny is uh, saying that she's read that some seahorses species produce sound by using the bony ridge at the back of their head to rub against cornet on top of the head. Can you tell us a bit more about how they communicate with each other? Jenny, yeah, I, that's what I understand too, but I've never had a chance to study their sound production. So that is what we're told. The few people who've looked at it do say exactly what you said. Um, they definitely communicate hugely with color. So uh, color changes are, are part of the social interaction, the, the courtship ritual. So what I haven't said is that seahorses in many species, not all, but many species form permanent pair bonds. 
the male and the female come together and dance every morning all through his pregnancy. And then the day he gives birth, the female has synchronized her timing and she's there with another load of eggs ready to go. And so um, he's always no moments. <laughs> pregnant. But what's interesting is they, when they come together every morning, they hold tails, they pirouette around a seagrass blade, for example. Um, they, they go for promenades with linked tails. So they're communicating by, by certainly by color and by touch. And they may well be communicating by sound. And I don't know how it changes over the courtship. And then, of course, the days that that turns into a mating, then it's an it's a exaggerated version of the same thing where they, they dance and they pirouette and they promenade and they rise through the water column to transfer the eggs. So awesome. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful animals. Candace uh, just asked, what day-to-day -day lifestyle changes can we do to help protect seahorses? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the biggest one is ask the provenance of your seafood. Is my seafood bottom trawled? Keep it simple. Was it caught with bottom trawlers? And if the person looks at you blankly, you can explain what bottom trawling is and that it's, you know, an abomination. And go back and ask again and again. The first really time. Think. Yeah, yeah. A bit of a <laughs> um, and that's a big one. And then I think obviously being attentive to climate issues is one that we're all going to have to really put our hearts and souls into. Um, and then, uh, you know, if you've got a bit of time, write a letter to somebody with influence to say, you know, what have you done for the ocean recently? And here's some suggestions to you. If you go to our website, projectseahorse.org, we have a brand new website as of three weeks ago, and I'm super Hi, excited right. about it. Um, and our brand new website has ways that you can help, um, help seahorses and help the ocean for sure. Um, if you live near the ocean, you know, talk up protected areas, make a, make a real effort to get set aside zones in the ocean. Yeah, I think the whole idea of understanding like that marine protected areas, uh, to your point, oftentimes aren't fully protected. And I know it's <laughs> it's it's even when Sil when Sylvia was with uh, you know former President Bush and they were talking about marine protected areas and he was sort of gobsmacked to find out that fishing happened in marine protected areas. So or in, why do or they call them? Why are they protect? You know? <laughs> why do they call them sanctuaries? So I mean, <laughs> even if the leaders don't really even understand that marine protected areas aren't actually fully protected, then you know that's it's, it's a problem. So advocating for full protection right. of areas, uh, and not you know not to the point that that you can't go diving in them, but to the point that that you're not doing extractive non use. Yeah, non-destructive use. You're not doing extractive activity. Well, at least you have zones. I mean, you can have, often it's very good to have a core reserve with a buffer zone around it where local people are allowed to fish because then it becomes ever so much more valuable to them and right. therefore the protection will go up. So there's zoning can make sense for sure. But you know, one of the biggest things you can do actually is just talk about the ocean with people, with your friends, with your family. Uh, you know, if you ask me the single biggest issue, it's that our constituency of support, our pool of supporters for the ocean is just not big enough. Right. And we need desperately is for everybody to realize, you know, you started with that lovely iconic um, blue uh, sphere, and we just need to keep talking up the fact that there is only one ocean, first of all, it's yeah. all connected, it's one ocean, and that we desperately need to, everybody put their heart and soul in. And if anybody's listening from the interior of a country, you know, uh, where they don't have access to the coast, please know that what you let run out of your car into the tiniest stream near you will end up in our ocean. What seafood you buy in your supermarket will influence our ocean policy. What vote you give, what letter you write to your congressperson, you know, all of this plays out. You, you still are a part of our ocean family, really. And yep. we'd love to contribute in every way you possibly can. And of course, get to the ocean when you can too. <laughs> Absolutely. Dive in. <laughs> Dive in. <laughs> Well, we've uh, just about hit the top of the hour, and I know your time's uh, tight today, so we really want to thank you for uh, diving in with us. We really appreciate your time and all your advocacy for seahorse and kin and the marine environment in total. Um, and so thank you, and thank you to our guests and producer, all of our viewers. Thank you, Ocean Elders, um, and the diving community and the that shows up time and time again to dive in with us. Water connects us all and we're so grateful to everyone. Um, we're gonna be back in September. We're taking a little break during August, but we'll be back in September with Dr. Edith Witter and we're gonna be talking about bioluminescence. Cool, I wonder if there's a bioluminescent 
seahorse out there or maybe a fluorescent one. They are very cool when you, yeah, I'll tell you a story about that, but yes, they, <laughs> they have very cool colors. So Sylvia, I'm looking forward to seeing you in September. Yes, uh, we're going to be there to cheer Sunday. your wonderful prize. Yes. I mean, I cheer Indianapolis prize for recognizing you. Yeah, so it'll be really fun to get a chance to chat. And thank you so much for inviting me to join you. It's been really yes. good fun and uh, yeah. look, forward to, look forward to following your, your dive-ins. <laughs> So Bye. let me remind everyone to take care of the ocean as if our life depends on it. Because they it do. Does. It does. It they does. Do. It does. One ocean. One, one ocean. ocean. One ocean. <laughs> but all of our lives. All right. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.